good morning everyone and welcome to our new uh residents and interns and fellows and students the new academic year uh it's uh one of the expectations of this program is that during uh friday mornings from seven till ten this is your protected uh, educational time for conferences where you're expected to be here and nowhere else unless you're actively saving someone's life so um, uh, these conferences are important for your uh, development uh, during training and uh, please understand that our expectation is that you'll be here uh, and uh, and attend and not run off to uh, to do cases or anything else uh, but Warmest welcome to all of our uh, new trainees. Uh, this morning we have grand rounds from Dr. Bill Cheadle, who's a professor in the Department of Surgery. He's he was my mentor when I was uh, a resident, so he's been around a while, long time program director. He's uh, done uh, everything you can imagine in academic surgery, and he's going to give us a big overview of the history of surgery today. So, uh, Dr. Cheadle, please uh, proceed. Thank you, Dr. McMasters. Uh, it's a pleasure to be here. It's an exciting time. And let me, uh, July is always exciting. We did a perforated atrium the first day of trauma call a year, so that was pretty exciting. But let me add the, my words of welcome uh, to all of you. Uh, you've made the right decision to choose the University of Louisville. We've got the best training in general surgery, I think, on the planet here, but you'll you certainly work hard. So uh, I'm going to go over uh, a lot of history here and I actually do have some disclosures. Three of the references that I used uh, quite a bit, uh, I think every general surgeon ought to have in their library if they're interested in surgery. The first is Ira Repkow's Illustrated Surgery. It's a huge uh, volume, belongs on your coffee table somewhere. The second is The Rise of Surgery by the Wangensteins. And Owen Wangstein was a longtime chairman of the University. His wife actually had a doctorate uh, in history. That's a very, very well referenced, thick book that's sort of based on operations. And finally, uh, Wendy Moore's The Knife Man, which is really a fun, easy read about John Hunter. Sort of a, each chapter is a little vignette about him. He was sort of a wild man, interesting guy that really is uh, regarded as the founder of. Uh, surgical science at a time when Galenism was uh, going on for 1,500 years. So that's a really fun read, and you know, I'd, I'd recommend all three to you. So uh, operations have been going on since the ascent of man. It's just simply a tissue dissection. However, surgery, that's the special within medicine that deals with the study, underlying science, and treatment of diseases, injuries, and deformities in which an operation is often performed. So there's a distinction there. And I would argue, uh, as I said, operations have been going on since the ascent of man, but surgery really has only developed in the last three or 400 years. So if we go way back, one of the first operations that was ever done was skull uh, trepanation back in 10,000 BC. Uh, this was done for airheads to let the air out, not really, but uh, it was rarely done for a, a, a good reason, that would be subdural and epidural hematomas. These are some of the examples here. They uh, remind me of the residents after walk rounds back in the 70s. The Edmund Smith papyrus was is the oldest surgical treatment, <laughs> treatise rather. It's not Edwin Smith's papyrus, but the ancient Egyptians from 5,000 years ago, he discovered and was eventually translated. And there is some uh, remarks about surgery uh, in this particular document. As soon as surgery uh, got cut off, or got uh, going, uh, Malpractice uh, rose very quickly, and you can see that uh, some of these were fairly dracon draconian, ancient, draconian and ancient. Uh, what's that? What's that? Everything going okay? Everything going okay? All right, yes, I got, sir, I got so an so echo here. So 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 let me figure out. Somebody's got a hot mic. Got... If you're not talking, yeah. please move. Turn your mics off, everybody. All right, uh, no echo, so that's good. So. Trashruta was a uh, Indian uh, surgeon, the founder of plastic surgery. Apparently, the ancient Indians had uh, a fetish with their noses, and he described uh, lots of different ways of doing rhinoplasty and had sort of an interesting classification of surgery as well. 
Aesculapius uh, is the uh, son of Apollo and Cronus, an ancient uh, Greek uh, mortal and half god, I guess, if you will. Uh, he was the father of Hygieia and Panacea and Lasso and Agil, who were all interested in the health of the uh, Greek population at the time. And apparently, he did an apprenticeship with a centaur, Chiron, who was uh, uh, teacher of, of uh, health at the time. And uh, so you could argue he might have been the first surgical resident. The uh, staff and snake that he has is the uh, uh, initial uh, uh, symbol of the uh, medicine, and it's still today uh, in the uh, held on today in the form of the caduceus. So Hippocrates uh, lived a uh, long time ago, and he published a very uh, extensive uh, body of work called the Corpus Hippocraticum. And it he does mention uh, training instruments, orthopedics, apprenticeship for fee, actually, which is sort of interesting, and laudable pus, which uh, at the time, uh, most wounds pussed out. And that was a good thing, rather than having cellulitis or erysipelas and dying of septic shock. He still believed in cautery. And it's interesting, like in his original oath uh, that we take at the end of medical school, is uh, uh, cautions uh, physicians uh, not to operate, which is probably a good uh, thing even today. Most operations were skin surgery, essentially, but occasionally uh, intestinal uh, work was done. Uh, and here's an example of where the intestine was opened to create a fistula for strangulated hernia. One only imagines that most of these people died anyway, and maybe a few actually uh, healed. So Galen was the surgeon to the gladiators. He was a prolific author. He had a seven volume uh, work that really uh, laid the foundation for most medical practice for the next 1500 years and felt that everything was due to the disorders of four humors. And of course that was completely wrong. And, and uh, he based a lot of his anatomy on anatomy. Anatom anatomical descriptions rather on animal anatomy. And the treatments, of course, and bloodletting, purgatives, and medics uh, really weren't very helpful for, for anything. But this dogma continued on for a long, long time, really until Hunter in the 17th century. Celsus was a Roman nobleman who also wrote a lot about surgery and hernia. He even wrote about Dr. McMaster's right there. And so he uh, described uh, four aspects of inflammation that we know today. And his work was published later after the invention of the Gutenberg Press in 1450. So to summarize, Dark and Middle Ages, which is really from the fall of the Roman Empire to the Renaissance, the barber surgeons uh, did these kind of operations here where, where nothing other than amputation were, were really much of uh, a procedure. Tonsuring is those wonderful little priest haircuts that uh, they did. The barbershop uh, pole is actually uh, the symbol for the cap is the uh, leeches, and the red and white uh, uh, stripes are bloody and clean bandages. So this goes way, way back uh, in time. One of the exceptions uh, to the rule is Guy de Chuliac, who uh, lived in the 14th century, wrote a huge text called the Chirurgia Magna that was sort of the text of the time for the next two or three hundred years. He was a physician to the Pope, which was helpful because at the time the church really didn't believe in. Uh, human dissection at the time, and I think he helped to convince them uh, otherwise. So the barbers and surgeons were a bit of a rivalry during the, the uh, Dark and Middle Ages, and so King Henry finally uh, united the Fellowship of Surgeons and the Company of Barbers to the Guild of Barber Surgeons uh, in the mid-16th uh, century, and this lasted for another uh, couple hundred years until the surgeons again split off from the uh, barber surgeons in the mid 18th century to form the Royal College of Surgeons of England. Another great barber surgeon in the 16th century was Ambrose Perre. His depiction of the wounded man is probably uh, still a classic and he wrote uh, his uh, work, which was published in 1575. He really uh, believed in ligature and I think got people to turn around to use ligature instead of cautery. Most amputations were done right through the necrosis because surgeons were afraid of bleeding. He realized that that was not a good idea and uh, amputated above that. And then basically invented the flying ambulance, which got soldiers off the battlefield and into uh, tents away from the battlefield where historically uh, most soldiers either died instantly or 
slowly on the battlefield and were attended to uh, there. So anatomy was really the, the most important initial uh, subject uh, of the Renaissance. And here you see Andre Vasilius uh, dis, uh, dis, uh, dissecting a, a body and uh, showing it off to a whole audience here. And you can see that the guys in the front row are sort of paying attention. The rest of them are bored and are talking to each other in a sleep because uh, they don't really have too, too good of a view. And that, uh, of course, changes over time. The importance of uh, anatomy, again, is depicted in this famous Rembrandt painting uh, of the time. In, 15, in the mid-16th century, William Harvey described the circulation finally correctly. He sort of did an interesting experiment of veins and noticing which way the blood flowed. He was really the first experimental physiology in his book, uh, The Mortu Cordis, was a classic at the time and basically the first textbook of physiology and, and was was the first really uh, true experiment to disprove prove some of uh, Galen's uh, original hypotheses. Anatomy continued on at the uh, University of Edinburgh at the time, which was the premier medical school in the world. And four generations of Monroe's taught anatomy there for over 150 years. And it's sort of interesting, as I'll get to in a minute, that Ephraim McDowell, Kentucky, actually visited and took these uh, Courses. The Hunter brothers were both Scots, actually practiced their entire time in England. William was an obstetrician and a, an anatomy dissector. And John, uh, his younger brother, joined him to act, uh, uh, when he was only 20 years old and then moved on to really become one of the great uh, surgeons of all time. This was the era of the body snatching. Uh, the uh, uh, British government or the monarchy would allow four to six bodies a year to be dissected, uh, but uh, that wasn't enough for most of the anatomists, so they went to the grave and they could pull those babies out in 15 minutes, and, and uh, it was very quick. Uh, eventually, the public got uh, upset with all this, and the Anatomy Act was passed in the next century, uh, uh, stating basically that you had to give permission to be dissected, at least your family. So John Hunter was a dentist, uh, surgeon, autopsy pathologist. He said to have dissected over 2,000 humans and a whole variety of animals. His home in London was basically a miniature zoo, zoo with all sorts of crazy animals there. He had a very uh, successful uh, lecture series of which he had to take some laudanum to calm him down <laughs> uh, prior to that. And he discussed some of the major operations that we do today, but uh, emphasize these were only done at the last ditch. And again, no elective surgery was being done at this time. But he actually sort of described uh, what we now know as an R0 resection. His treatise on uh, gunshot wounds and inflammation is a classic. And at the time, uh, uh, all bullets and shrapnel and the like were removed because uh, bullets and gunpowder were thought to be poisonous. Turns out he came across a uh, cave of French soldiers that had been about three or four weeks ago and noticed that they were all doing well and they were dealing and granulating and bullets inside. He published this, this stopped this unnecessary over dissection to pull out bullets that you see in Hollywood all the time in the movies. Uh, many of his sections are, are uh, on display at the Hunterian Museum and the Royal College of Surgeons in Lincoln Fields. I've been here. It's really a fantastic. Uh, expose and there you see in the middle is the eight foot uh, uh, Irish giant Mr. Byrne that he uh, worked hard and, and probably uh, uh, unethically uh, stole the <laughs> to uh, boil him and uh, cure his bones. So uh, not to be outdone the uh, American surgeon Ephraim McDowell uh, as I mentioned before studied under Monroe came back and was a premier surgeon in Kentucky. All the UofL and UK residents ought to know the story. He uh, came upon Jane Todd, Todd Crawford, who the hospital in Danville was named after, on Christmas Day uh, in the kitchen table of uh, his home, uh, removed a 22-pound ovarian tumor through laparotomy. And he talks about his op note, washing the intestines with warm water and stuff. And, suturing the wound closed. I imagine he did a midline to do this rather than a fan steel. Uh, and miraculously, post-op five, he came in to see her. She's up walking around making her bed. And she outlived him by a number of years. 
He also operated on President Polk uh, for bladder stones and was given credit, given credit for this initial laparotomy by uh, Samuel Gross. Most uh, uh, victims of gunshot wounds to the chest or abdomen died either of blood loss or infection. One of the few exceptions was Alexis St. Martin, who had a musket uh, injury to his upper ribs and the chest and stomach and eventually developed a gastropleural cutaneous fistula. And uh, William Beaumont attended to him and studied uh, digestion for probably 20 years and published uh, on this. And Alexis St. Martin lived to be 86 years old, so you never know. The most famous surgeon of the uh, 19th century was Samuel David Gross. Uh, he was born and raised in Philadelphia, and then actually came to Louisville, and was our second chairman of the Department of Surgery uh, for 15 years. Uh, he did a lot of experimental work, uh, doing an intestinal resection and astomosis in experimental animals, and it was a prolific uh, uh, author and a widely renowned surgeon. He then returned to uh, Jefferson in Philadelphia, and this is the famous Eakins picture of the Gross Clinic with Gross himself uh, operating and just uh, an amazing human being. So, as I mentioned before, virtually all surgery uh, was uh, urgent or emergent at the time, and elective surgery did not, essentially did not exist. So what are the requ requisites of this? Uh, certainly technical expertise is important. Some of that was already uh, uh, achieved by some of the great surgeons of the time. But the three A's, asepsis, antisepsis, real requisites, and I add physiology of the circulation and intravenous fluid resuscitation and availability of blood and blood banking as other uh, requisites. So Ignaz Semmelweis uh, was an obstetrician uh, at the Algemein Krankenhaus, and he uh, insisted that his uh, staff and students uh, wash their hands and uh, in Dakin solution, which is sodium hypochlorite, before doing uh, recurrent pelvic exams on parchment uh, women. At the time, uh, many of the students and uh, staff were dissecting cadavers and going up without washing their hands, checking for cervical dilatation and uh, going back and dissecting more cadavers. So the incidence of purpural fever, which is a fancy word for endometritis, was sky high. And, and uh, word soon passed that uh, the uh, maternal mortality rate was much, much lower in his wards. And uh, women, basically, who came to the Algemeyer Crockett House basically begged to be on his ward because they knew they had a better chance of surviving uh, childbirth. Joseph Lister was generally an orthopedic surgeon, and uh, he noticed one day on a train change, and Hiram has a nice story about this, that the town garbage quit smelling. And so he uh, asked the city engineers, what, what's going on here? And he said, well, we sprayed carbolic acid on the garbage and it stopped smelling. He thought, well, maybe that is some putrefaction. And of course, bacteria were just beginning to be described, really not even at that time, a couple of decades later. So in the end of the Civil War, he operated on an 11-year-old boy with an open fracture using carbolic acid, and that young man survived for the useful extremity. As you know, the treatment for open fracture uh, uh, was amputation uh, up until this time. So it was a huge, huge uh, advance in surgery uh, at the time. And so many of the uh, operations were done in sort of a haze over the next uh, few decades of of, uh, of uh, carbolic acid. And it really wasn't until uh, 1928 and, and even World War II before the clinical trials were done uh, for penicillin. And at the same time, Gerard Domach uh, invented or discovered sulfonilamide, but he was in Nazi Germany at the time and was still limited uh, to the German uh, Reich. And then finally, uh, another 25 years later, it wasn't until Dr. Pope did a uh, randomized prospective definitive trial showing that basically an antibiotic, in this case, Loradine, uh, given on call uh, to the operating room, uh, markedly reduced uh, wound infection rates. And this is a time where you could actually use a placebo. So you can see 30% to 5% literally changed clinical practice overnight. 
Anesthesia, well, uh, opium, uh, alcohol, and their combination, which is known as laudanum, been around since ancient times, and I'm sure were used, and uh, probably used on Jane Trod Crawford. Ether was discovered, though, really the first general anesthetic by Crawford Long, but it wasn't until 1846 and a public demonstration by Morton and Warren uh, at the Massachusetts General Hospital, later known as the Ether Dome, that this stuff really worked, and it amazed uh, physicians and the public as well. Oliver Wendell Holmes, author and physician, said, you ought to call this anesthesia, and that's how it started. Chloroform and nitric oxide were also introduced uh, a little bit later on um, and when we used primarily in for obstetrical uh, anesthesia. So you can see all the developments here uh, in anesthesia over time. Most of them occurred uh, prior to the 1950s, and really only the idea of PEEP and then, uh, of course, propofol were, were added on a little bit later. So I was sort of surprised at this, that uh, really in the 30s and 40s, they had anesthesia down reasonably well although uh, gas uh, was not uh, uh, really used until the 50s. Uh, Walter Cannon was uh, the famous Harvard professor of physiology and, and military advisor to uh, uh, in World War uh, One and II. Uh, he was the first one to really render a precise description of what was known as wound shock, and uh, it was decreased O2 delivery because of lack of intravascular volume in blood. Ringers has been around forever since 1885, but the knowledge of how to use it and when to use it took a few more decades to figure out. Blood banking and whole blood transfusion was done in World War I, and it's sort of interesting that Dr. Harbrick says our new transfusion, uh, mass transfusion protocol and the coolers will now for the first time, I guess ever here, uh, uh, contain uh, whole blood. Alfred Blaylock at Vanderbilt described shock in more detail, and Tom Shires did a ton, bunch of experiments uh, back in the 70s demonstrating that uh, there was a lot of third spacing uh, with resuscitation and leakage of uh, capillary uh, fluid, and therefore one had to resuscitate with, with much more crystalloid than uh, one would estimate by uh, blood loss. And this led to the old three to one dogma which uh, we used quite a bit when I was a resident and put a whole lot of people probably in ARDS because of it. And only in the last couple of decades uh, have this, has this been sort of revisited and uh, dropped down to the current one-to-one -one dogma of, of blood, blood products and uh, crystalloid. And then lastly, the lethal triad was recognized of hypothermia, uh, uh, coagulopathy, and acidosis. And the idea of stopping and just controlling contamination and bleeding and then taking uh, the patient back uh, has really been a relatively recent uh, finding in the last uh, 40 years or so. So and this was true for small bowel obstruction. Finally, uh, investigators realized that this was a hypovolemic state. Intravenous fluids so were not really used a whole lot until the 20s and 30s. And interestingly, uh, Don Baxter formed Baxter Pharmaceuticals at the time. He was a U of L med student, and essentially, uh, this company is still in business today, manufacturing intravenous fluids, and their family gave a wonderful gift to our medical school. That's why we have Baxter One and Baxter Two uh, buildings uh, for research. Also, Owen Wangenstein, who I mentioned before, did a whole series of dog experiments trying to understand uh, uh, the process of, of, of bowel necrosis in this disease. and figured out using uh, dogs with NG tubes that virtually all air was swallowed. And what he did is he literally ligated uh, the intestine without killing it and showed that dogs could last uh, for days and days uh, with an NG tube and, and IV fluids. And so he invent basically invented what we commonly know, was commonly known as the Salem sump uh, nasogastric tube, and this uh, prevented uh, necrosis. So modern surgery basically, I would say, began in the uh, 19th century with uh, Bernard uh, von Langenbeck and the German Surgical Society, which was founded in 1872, and Langenbeck's uh, archives, which is uh, the oldest uh, journal devoted uh, to surgery to this day. And so his disciples uh, 
did very well. And then many American British surgeons uh, uh, traveled to Vienna, uh, Berlin, and uh, Bern to see these great surgeons and what they were doing at the time. So this is what I describe as the professionalization of surgery during this time. And the American Surgical Foundation is our most uh, prestigious organization here in this country and probably the world for that matter. And it was founded a few years later after the German Surgical Society and our own Samuel Gross was president for the first uh, three years and unfortunately died uh, in 1884. Maybe he'd been president for four years. But we've had David Yandel and then over a hundred years later, Dr. Polk, and uh, Kirby Bland, who was on the faculty here, he uh, actually interviewed him uh, when I was a student uh, some 41 years ago, and he uh, was president. And then uh, more recently, uh, Mark Evers, who trained here as a resident, he was a year uh, behind me, uh, was the treasurer of this organization, and our own Dr. McMasters is now the treasurer-elect. And what's important about this is a vote for an officer is a vote for president. So. Both of these world-class surgeons will become president of the most prestigious uh, organization in the world and a big uh, feather in the cap for, for not only the individuals, but the uh, University of Louisville Department of Surgery. So to talk a little bit more about uh, the, uh, the uh, surgeons of that uh, 19th century time, we're familiar with the Bill Roth I and the Bill Roth II. Uh, they're both done for um, gastric ulcer or gastric cancer. One is a, the Bill Roth one is a gastro duodenostomy, whereas the Bill Roth two is a gastro uh, jejunostomy. And of course, if you're at University of Louisville, they all need to be done anticholic. <laughs> so um, he was, he worked at the Algemein Krankenhaus in Vienna, same place that Semmelweis worked, did a whole lot of first, laryngectomy, esophagectomy, gastric, I mean, he was a military uh, surgeon as well, so he was trained uh, in a time of war and wrote a huge um, uh, text uh, on both uh, surgical disease and its pathology. And like a lot of these surgeons in the 19th, 18th, and 19th century, they were friends of the great composers uh, at the time. He was quite a good friend of Brahms, uh, and a, an accomplished pianist. And, Interestingly, adopted the white coat. So you can thank Bill Roth uh, for the white coat ceremony that you uh, do when you start uh, medical school. Well, it turns out with these operations, uh, there was a fair amount of uh, bile reflux back into the stomach and the esophagus in a certain amount of patients. So Cesar Rue, who uh, 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 was a uh, Swiss surgeon, developed what he called Lewin, the lupin Y, where he, the jejunum is transected and the distal end is sewn to whatever you want to sew it to. In this case, he sewed it to the uh, remaining uh, stomach, and he had outstanding results, over a 50% mortality rate. And you sort of laugh at that, but you know what the mortality rate was for gastric outlet obstruction at the time? Of course, it was 100%. So Bill Roth and Rue, were operating on people with gastric outlet obstruction. These were, these were really not elective operations. They were urgent operations. Uh, Rue realized pretty quickly that if you don't take a lot of stomach out, you develop a Rue syndrome where the stomach doesn't empty and uh, people are bloated and nauseated and that sort of thing. So he, he pretty quickly realized that this operation, if you're going to connect the Rue limb to the stomach, that you don't, you, you don't want a lot of stomach left. So. You really don't want to do this uh, unless uh, you take out uh, most of the stomach. And he also uh, interestingly did the first uh, resection for a pheochromocytoma. Dr. Coker is a pioneer thyroid surgeon in Bern, Switzerland. He's got all kinds of things named after him. Uh, he was really a, a proponent of very precise bloodless operation, and that's probably where Halstead got his technique from. And remember, he wasn't operating on thyroid cancers. He was operating on big, huge goiters. There was a huge uh, goiter belt in Switzerland at the time because of lack of iodine uh, in the food. And so these are big thyroids that are tough to do that uh, Dr. Quillo does when she goes to Kenya, I would imagine. But unfortunately, what happened, he'd take the whole thyroid out and then everybody died of mixed edema. So he described this and realized that 
we've got to lead a little bit of thyroid last uh, left to pre prevent this and, and for that uh, those descriptions he won the 1909 uh, Nobel Prize and also uh, authored a major text uh, of the era and I, I think you can see the theme here if you want to get famous you, you need to write <laughs> Harvey Cushing was essentially the world's first full-time neurosurgeon. He worked at the uh, Brigham, uh, described the reflux associated with intracranial pressure elevation, a syndrome and disease with various uh, glucocorticoid deficiencies or excess. But most importantly, uh, he had a huge, he, he took meticulous records of every patient and kept those records uh, because he wanted to prove that, that that major neurosurgery was safe at the time. And these are all housed in a particular wing at the Yale uh, Medical Library, at the Yale Medical School. Now, we all use a Bovi, and here's Mr. Bovi here, or probably Dr. Bovi. Uh, he was a physicist at the Massachusetts uh, uh, Institute of Technology. You sort of look at him. He looks like he's a physicist at MIT. And he invented uh, what was at the time uh, bipolar cautery because if you're a neurosurgeon, you don't want a, a field of uh, heat or thermal injury going to uh, adjacent parts of the brain. So he initially described electric cautery uh, in a bipolar mode. And of course, we typically use it uh, in a monopolar mode unless you're in the neck or, or head. We often perform Hartman procedures and Henri. Hartman uh, was a surgeon in France who described this uh, procedure in 1931 at a time where perforated colon cancer was essentially lethal. And there was a uh, one stage uh, operation that was performed for a while, excuse me, a three stage operation was performed for a while where a diverting transverse colostomy was done. And it was pretty quickly realized that when you leave the inflammatory focus in there, that's not really a good idea. So, diversion without source control. Uh, he learned was a bad idea. And of course, we've now modified that to benign disease because at the time, colon cancer uh, presented with bleeding, obstruction, or perforation, not uh, uh, screening colonoscopy uh, like they are uh, nowadays. So switch gears a little bit. We'll talk about uh, hernias from ancient times. They were treated by all kinds of crazy things like trusses and taxes until uh, Eduardo Bassini, uh, published a case series in 1889 where he did the really the first anatomical repair of the uh, of the uh, groin. All attempts prior to that were essentially scarification, leading to a huge recurrence rate. And this was a conjoint tendon to the shelving edge of the hand ligament. And I still use that in young uh, young uh, people today that uh, I don't really want to put mesh in for a whole lifetime. Chester McVeigh was well known, and we did sort of this procedure pretty much uh, uh, most of the time on adult hernias in the 80s, uh, 70s, and 80s. And uh, he actually uh, wrote a uh, his PhD PhD thesis on the anatomy of the inguinal canal, and he felt that the Cooper's ligament was the correct way to go. Uh, unfortunately, uh, this requires a relaxing incision, which is another incision. Uh, this procedure hurts a lot. The recurrence rate was reasonably high. And so uh, eventually, particularly when laparoscopic uh, hernia uh, came along, uh, the, this procedure uh, is really only done now for uh, femoral hernias. So uh, in our attempt to become famous, uh, Bex Barnett and I published a series of a uh, Cooper's ligament repair, but mesh in between Cooper's ligament and the conjoint tendon for incarcerated femoral hernias. And I think that's uh, uh, really a, a neat procedure to go because sometimes these are difficult to reduce uh, laparoscopically. I know I did one with good old Nick Nash when he was the chief resident at the VA and we split the inguinal ligament and, and really had a hard time getting that uh, hernia uh, reduced. And so I think this is a, a nice little operation, but I'm not sure anybody else does. And of course, nowadays, uh, most of these are done laparoscopically. Uh, I still do the open type, but I think most of, the, most of these are done laparoscopically now. I think some of the uh, problems with the laparoscopic repair that we initially saw with colon perforation and uh, mesh in the bladder and all kinds of terrible uh, outcomes from what should not even be the transparent needle operation sort of turned me off to it. But I think now, uh, 
Uh, this is done fairly precisely, and, 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 and the surgeons know how to stay away from areas uh, which will cause uh, uh, what I call causalgia or tack induced pain uh, from nerves. And I think that's been reasonably well worked out. Intestinal anastomosis uh, uh, really is a relatively uh, recent thing. As I mentioned in ancient Greece, uh, uh, there really wasn't an anastomosis. They just did a fistula and hoped, hoped the thing healed, and occasionally it did. There was all kinds of different interesting things, rings and Murphy's button and that sort of thing. But really, Antoine Lim Limbert in 1826 decided <clears throat> described his seromuscular suture, which is what we use today. We often add a canal procedure. <laughs> excuse me, uh, to it, uh, which is basically an inner layer of chromic, which ends up dissolving anyway. And that's still sort of the standard anastomosis. So it's been around almost 200 years now. And then Mark Ravage, who is uh, quite an icon and a carmudgeon, interesting guy and a great author, uh, pediatric surgeon, uh, dis described uh, the current uh, disposable cartridge staplers, which uh, continued to evolve uh, back in the 60s, and and um, big long trial uh, of many many hundreds of patients at the Mayo Clinic, probably 20 20 30 years ago, showed that there's no difference uh, in leak or obstruction rate between stapled or uh, uh, hand sewn anastomoses when done for elective uh, procedures. There's a little bit of uh, difference in the trauma patients now that I think about it. And I think uh, uh, staple is a little bit better uh, in the trauma patient, but I can't uh, I can't uh, remember for sure. So Dr. Harbrick can correct me on that. So the Whipple procedure, that's sort of the macho procedure of the surgical oncologist uh, that all of us love to do. Um, Whipple himself was a Princeton Columbia grad and then practiced most of his time at Memorial. Uh, the triad uh, um, is named after him for low blood sugar and uh, seen with uh, insulinomas. And he actually had quite a bit of pancreatic experience and initially described the Whipple procedure, which is named after him in 1935, as a two-stage operation. And remember, in those days, <clears throat> uh, vitamin K wasn't known. And uh, what happened with these, all these people would present with obstructive jaundice and coagulopathy. So what he did was a cholecystogastrostomy and gastrojejunostomy to decompress the stomach and decompress the biliary tree, tune up the patients in the pre-TPN eras, and then go ahead and do the standard resection. But if you notice there, there's no anastomosis from the pancreas. He just drained it. He did not uh, do an anastomosis. And interestingly enough, he only operated on people with ampullary and distal common bile duct cancers. He felt that ductal carcinoma pancreas was really uh, inoperable at the time. Of course, that's been shown not to be true anymore, and the operation has been used for a whole host of uh, distal common bile duct, duodenal, ampullary, and ductal carcinoma of the uh, pancreas. Rudolf Nissen, uh, we do the Nissen procedure still. Uh, he was a very interesting uh, guy. He described this in 1956. He was a Jew in Nazi Germany at a, at a bad time in the 30s. Actually had an appointment uh, at the uh, Charity Hospital in Berlin. And his boss even went to Hermann Goebbels himself uh, and asked that, that uh, Nissen uh, be kept on the faculty. And Goebbels actually agreed, but Nissen would have nothing to do with it. And so he and all other uh, Jewish uh, faculty had a diaspora to Turkey in 1933. All the Jewish patients were kicked out of the hospital. All the Jewish faculty were fired in a terrible time, obviously. And so he actually uh, developed many of his techniques while in Turkey and then migrated to New York in the 1940s, perfected the fund application uh, uh, there before retiring in Basel, uh, Switzerland. Interestingly, the, the esophagus was not the only thing that he wrapped. He actually wrapped Alfred with aneurysm. Einstein actually lived another seven years after this wrapping for a little trivia for you all. Ivor Lewis, I always thought was two people, and I've seen his name hyphenated and that sort of thing. So when I looked him up, I, you know, Ivor is just a funny Welsh first name. Uh, but he was quite a prominent surgeon uh, around World War II, did the first pulmonary embolectomy, 
And again, like uh, <clears throat> Cushing had a very uh, uh, detailed description of his patients and kept a great uh, patient database. And uh, of course, is the uh, founder of the two stage esophagectomy, the, the first uh, opening up the abdomen and, and uh, mobilizing the stomach and then going into the chest and sewing it at about the azagus vein. And that's still held to today. Oh, there's another. There's other types uh, as well. Brooke, I think, uh, did one of the great things in surgery in the <clears throat> 20th century, at a time where where ileostomies were a disaster. Uh, they all virtually they were they were done similar to a colonoscopy, excuse me, a colostomy, and placed uh, right skin level and of course they all strictured down and, and scarred the skin and that sort of thing and he came up with a simple idea of just turning it back on itself so that you have a projection of, of small bowel that, where the succus and uh, uh which is highly toxic to skin uh, and erodes uh, skin as we know in fistula cases uh, this was easy to bag and i think was a huge contribution uh, to those with uh, particularly uh, inflammatory bowel disease. We go back a little bit to, uh, with Alexis Carell. He was a French surgeon and, and experimental biologist. And actually, he and Charles Lindbergh of aviation fame developed the first perfusion pump, which is a precursor to the modern cardiopulmonary bypass. He also uh, uh, did a lot of cell culture work. And actually, uh, won the Nobel Prize for not only perfusion pump, for the simple uh, a simple uh, suturing of blood vessels and other tubes uh, by a triangulation technique so they wouldn't uh, uh, shrink down. And for this, he won the Nobel Prize. He got in a little bit of trouble about uh, some of his uh, views on purity of race and, at the time. Uh, but this uh, precursor led to John Gibbon, who was uh, really the pioneer of the cardiopulmonary bypass. He did a lot of cats in the 1930s and 40s. And it just took him forever to work out uh, all the logistics of it, uh, particularly the clotting problems, until 1953, finally, a, a uh, ASD was closed under total cardiopulmonary bypass. And this, of course, led to the field of open heart surgery, which was pioneered by this man, Michael DeBakey, certainly the most famous surgeon of the 20th century. And we, uh, I, I hire him, invite him here twice. and. I got the honor of being able to host him and really get to talk to him quite a bit. He's just an amazing human being. He almost made it to 100. He stopped operating at 90. He basically did the first coronary bypass, first coronary enterectomy, first error by FEMS in life, invented the MASH unit uh, in World War II that was popularized in Korea and Vietnam and won virtually every award that one can win. And he was a tough guy to work for. I have a friend uh, who was in his unit uh, as a second year resident. He just moved in and stayed there for a month. Uh, so he uh, really uh, pioneered the, the specialty of uh, cardiothoracic surgery. So there's a whole host of named instruments I think are sort of fun to think about when you call for them. And I was highly disappointed that it was not Dr. David Richardson, but Maurice Richardson. Uh, the Richardson. And as you see here, most of these uh, surgeons operated in the uh, or at least uh, lived in the late 19th and uh, early 20th century, with the exception of uh, Tom Fogarty of the Fogarty Catheter, who owns half of uh, Oregon uh, from the patent rights. So uh, professionalism surgery requires professionalism and training, and leave it to the French to uh, uh, have uh, residents sleep in the hospital. And uh, the first chief resident was uh, named in 1642, and I can't pronounce that. If I tally's here, he can do it for me. William Stewart Halstead, of course, uh, started the first surgical residency in, at Johns Hopkins in 1899. He visited many of these surgeons, in fact, spent two years in Germany and Austria. In 33 years, he had seven chief, chief residents. That's a chief resident every other year. And most of these were prominent academicians who went on to uh, 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 prominent chairmanships uh, throughout the country. Oddly enough, he died of post-operative common bile duct stones, addicted to opium. He and four other surgeons experimented with cocaine back in the uh, late um, 1800s. And of those five, three died. Uh, Dr. Hall went to Santa Barbara 
uh, California and founded Cottage Hospital, uh, which I had my first job washing dishes <laughs> uh, when I was about 20 years old. So uh, life is sort of interesting. But the Hopkins reg Regency basically uh, followed the German plan. And uh, Dr. Halstead gave a famous uh, lecture in 1904, the training of the surgeon at Yale University. And uh, you can see this was the genesis of the uh, pyramidal program. Four doctors uh, uh, at Hopkins were Wells, Halstead, Osler, and Kelly. And uh, unfortunately, not all medical schools were like uh, the excellent school in uh, uh, at Hopkins. Uh, many of them were diploma mills, and this is from Gordon Tobin's uh, lecture on the 100th anniversary of the Flexner Report. Uh, they're just terrible uh, educational standards and, and the like. And here's an example: you get two years of high school, a year of so-called medical school, and now you've got a MD and a license to practice, and that was sort of ridiculous. And so Abraham Flexner pointed this out. He was a Louisville person, graduated from Yale. He was an educator and appointed by the Carnegie Institute. And his report in 1912 re revolutionized, uh, or 1910 revolutionized medical education. As you can see here, uh, the impact of a whole variety of organizations on uh, training in uh, general surgery. So. Uh, the American Board of Surgery certifies surgeons, the RC certifies institutions uh, and programs, uh, and now we have very uh, professionalized uh, programs throughout the country that uh, uh, we enjoy today because of that. And it's interesting, there was a huge proliferation of uh, residencies uh, post-World War II into the 70s, or over 600, and in comes Dr. Polk and Dr. Dean Warren, uh, in the 1970s who were uh, served on the RRC for surgery and recognized that many of these residencies were horrible and closed down about 400 or 300, over 300 of them. Not uh, not a popular move uh, for sure, but um, really did uh, students and residents and surgeons a huge favor by insisting on programs being quality. So the graduates could practice uh, uh, at the end of graduation. So the fellowships follow these. These are all the board uh, certified fellowships that you see on top in the middle. There's others that aren't approved, but still important. And now there's integrated plastics, excuse me, integrated uh, residencies popping up throughout, particularly in uh, plastic surgery uh, has become uh, very popular. And we now have our own integrated uh, plastic surgery residency which I think is a good thing. So postgraduate uh, medical education has been, been led by the American College of Surgeons. This was founded actually as a journal first, and then uh, Franklin Martin recruited a whole bunch of AMA members uh, and had the first uh, College of uh, Surgeons meeting in 1910, and it became the meeting that it is today with over 10,000 uh, uh, attendees every year. Uh, it's certainly the main education and political arm of organized surgery, and it was only until 1994 that SG&O, their journal, actually changed to uh, the Journal of American College of Surgeons, and the only faculty person in the history of the University of Louisville Department of Surgery to be president of this organization is Richard Sam, uh, otherwise known as Master Yoda. And he also reminds me to uh, tell everybody that he's also, and more importantly, and past president of the Kentucky Thoroughbred Horse Racing Association. So I would argue that this was probably the most important invention in the 20th century. Uh, uh, and uh, this was Sven Seldinger's technique of sticking a wire in an artery after you cannulate it. And literally this gave rise to four different specialties, uh, especially of endovascular surgery, where now we can put in grafts uh, virtually anywhere and revolutionized this specialty from an open specialty to a Seldinger based uh, specialty, if you will. And uh, similarly, interventional biliary endoscopist, the same concept. Uh, this was uh, became, uh, was invented essentially in the late 60s and early 70s. And in the mid 70s, uh, Claude Ligary, a gastroenterologist from Paris, uh, went to Japan to learn this technique. And that's who Gary rotated with uh, some 30 years ago. And it's really Gary who brought complicated interventional ERCP along with uh, a selection of French Bordeaux uh, to Louisville. Uh, 
and really is one of the world's best interventional biliary endoscopists. And this is, of course, essentially phased out uh, common bile duct exploration. Gallbladder disease has been has a high, has had a high mortality since ancient times. Finally, somebody recognized gallstones were present at autopsy, and I love Glisson's quote: "Death is the only relief of biliary colic." And really, the only thing surgeons ever did was essentially drain a pointing abscess in the right upper quadrant, get a biliary fistula, until Longenbuch did the first uh, cholecystectomy in 1882. Uh, it was uh, Jerry Larson and I that finally did the first uh, lap coli here uh, in 1990. And of course, uh, within two years, that was a standard treatment for uh, all letters. Breast cancer has uh, uh, gone from big to small. The, 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 the breast kind of breast cancers that were seen in Halstead era are depicted on top there. And sort of interesting, I just noticed that the, uh, this patient's already had a mastectomy and still had this thing growing out of there that I'm sure she was afraid to, to deal with. And so he did a radical mastectomy where P major was taken. Finally, when the mammography and, and self-exam was performed and the realization that this was a huge problem, uh, Patey uh, uh, published on the modified radical mastectomy, which is sort of the same thing with an axillary dissection, but leaving P major. Smaller yet with partial mastectomy and ACVP showing that uh, this uh, plus that radiation therapy was uh, similar in survival to uh, mastectomy and then sentinel node biopsy by Giuliano, which is now uh, more really of a staging operation in smaller and smaller operations now because breast cancers are now uh, diagnosed, of course, by uh, mammography. So that's been a tremendous clinical advance in the last. Uh, Hundred years. I think nowhere other than nowhere, a, a no better example rather than the underlying science leading to the ability to do a surgical procedure is exemplified better than transplantation. So a lot of underlying work uh, was done, as you can see here, uh, to understand that there was an actual rejection reaction unless uh, these were done with identical twins. And of course, Joe Murray did the first one of these with identical twins, so there was no uh, immune suppression. And then he uh, eventually uh, used, uh, he and Roy Collin used uh, azathioprine uh, against rejection and cadaveric uh, uh, donation was realized. He then made a right-hand turn and devoted his career to uh, plastic surgery, mostly craniofacial, but was awarded the 1990 uh, Nobel Prize in Physiology and Medicine for his work on transplantation and immunology. Liver transplantation equals Tom Starzl, sort of an amazing uh, human being, surgeon scientist uh, who uh, had a huge immunology lab as well as uh, being a liver and liver transplant surgeon. He sort of started off as a uh, liver surgeon itself and then uh, migrated into transplants. They all died in the first five. So he uh, had did a self-imposed moratorium and finally with uh, uh, anti-rejection medicine performed the first uh, successful one in Denver, VA, 1977. And his lab uh, developed uh, or discovered the modern uh, immunosuppression that is used today. And then even described microchimerism, which is the holy grail transplant surgery that uh, Dr. Ilstead has spent a career working on, where hopefully no immune suppression will uh, be needed uh, if that can be uh, realized. In colon rectal surgery, uh, this started again at the University of Louis by, by Joseph Matthews, and uh, he he uh, was the first person to dedicate his uh, practice to nothing but the rectum, anus, and sigmoid flexure. He was a president of the American Medical Association and founded the American Proctologic Society, which eventually became American Society of Colorectal Surgeons. Uh, Alan Parks. Uh, uh, basically described Sir Alan Parks at St. Mark's described the ileal pouch anal anastomosis in 1978, which I think is the signature operation, especially in our own Dr. Susan Galandiak, superstar and uh, director of our uh, division of colorectal surgery, has been the editor of diseases in colon rectum now for five years. A tremendous honor. Pediatric surgery is also, uh, we have a star here in the University of Louisville. It was started in uh, 1936 by Dr. Ladd of the Ladd's Vans and Ladd Procedures. 
He uh, had a contract with the Brigham residents uh, and trained them in pediatric surgery. And this specialty sort of proliferated over time. It was the first specialty to have a special competence uh, certificate given by the American Board of Surgery. And they've uh, cleverly kept their numbers uh, small. and They're virtually all at major medical centers. And it's a 10-year project, basically, to uh, become a pediatric surgeon. I think that's probably because of the key index cases. And so our own Mary Fallett uh, was the president of the American Society of Pediatric Surgeons in 2015 and 16. I'll put ECMO on here just because uh, Bob Bartlett is why I'm here. Bob invented ECMO along with Dale Drinker at the Brigham. And uh, basically, uh, I was able to help him put a few of these neonates on uh, bypass and a lot of sheep back in the late 70s. And he's the one that gave me uh, Louisville's uh, name because he and Dr. Pope were friends and both because they were burn doctors. And of course, this has been a, a just a fantastic procedure in neonates. Still a little uh, uh, controversial adults, even though it's been adopted and we do it at Jewish and Norton's now. Uh, but I, uh, I think his contribution is sort of a Nobel laureate uh, material uh, as well. So trauma care, wars and gunpowder, the pathogenesis of, of or understanding the pathogenesis of wound shock really uh, has been the two major advances uh, uh, in uh, trauma care. And what I meant by wars and gunpowder is not an advance. It's a, <laughs> it's a requirement to learn how to do trauma care along with evolution of resuscitation stuff. And I wanted to put in a, a uh, plug for the public hospitals of this country because that's where the wars are still going on in our major cities. And Louisville General is a big part of that, describing modern trauma care. The University of Louisville has had a, uh, a uh, strong history in that. No fewer than three uh, Louisville people have been uh, president of the AAST and, uh, and uh, uh, Dr. Knorr has been uh, the uh, journal editor of their trauma. Um, the major impact, uh, I think, of the ACS in trauma center designation is to get patients triaged to major trauma centers. The ATLS course is taught all over the world now. And then finally, this specialty sort of morphed, or mer- merged rather, or morphed into acute care surgery to include trauma. That evolution has sort of been interesting as the Trauma surgeons have been watching more things. They need more uh, patients to operate on. They sort of sucked in acute care surgery because many general surgeons were taking less and less call. And this merge uh, will be uh, discussed uh, by Dr. David Richardson giving the uh, Pitts oration uh, next month at the uh, AAST. So the future of surgery, I think basic and clinical investigation will always continue. Mental techniques will get more and more or less and less invasive. And I think robotics clearly is is the uh, way of the future where you're sitting in an ergonomically uh, ideal position and regionalization of complex operations, which have already uh, really occurred. And then cancer immunotherapy uh, hopefully will replace the current chemotherapy uh, and maybe allow the surgical oncologist to operate on more patients through uh, such neoadjuvant uh, therapy. So I mentioned that uh, investigation will continue to go on, and how, do, how is that spread? That's spread by the peer review journal process. And U of L has also had a strong record in that area. Dr. Knorr, was the, who's Hiram's predecessor, was the journal editor of trauma. Both Dr. Polk and Dr. Bland were editors of the American Journal of Surgery. Dr. Richardson, the American surgeon. Dr. Fry and I edit uh, surgical infections. Dr. Glandiak, I've already mentioned, and then more re- more recently, Dr. McMasters himself has been uh, announced as the editor of surgical oncology. This is a huge honor and a huge amount of work for all these individuals, but lends the prestige of our program here at the uh, University of Louisville. So I was going to talk a little bit about viral pandemics, but I've got a watch right here at 756. So I, I'm going to stop uh, 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 right here and thank you all for your intention, in attention and congratulations on being a trainee here at the University of Louisville. Thank you very much. Thank you, Dr. Cheadle. I uh, can think of no better way to start our new academic year than to uh, instill in our uh, residents uh, our, uh, a sense of the history of surgery and the history of surgery at the University of Louisville. It's 
if you think hearing about a bunch of old dead surgeons is boring, <laughs> really realize that uh, Dr. Cheadle Letcher was anything but boring. Uh, it was fantastic. And uh, that uh, everything we do now is uh, because of those who came before us. One of those who came before us, uh, as mentioned by Dr. Cheadle, Dr. Rudy Knorr, who was Dr. Polk's predecessor as chair of this Department of Surgery and uh, many contributions, as Dr. Cheadle outlined. Um, and Dr. Polk uh, uh, recognized the other day that Dr. Knorr was missing in action. We put out an all points bulletin for Dr. Knorr, who we could not locate. His painting had disappeared from the Department of Surgery, who knows when, and, and we couldn't find him. But after an exhaustive manhunt, I am pleased to report, if you can see, there's Dr. Knorr. He has been located and he, is, he has been recovered. He's in my office right now next to Dr. Gross, who was the second chair of the Department of Surgery. And Dr. Knorr was the 14th and I'm the 16th. So uh, congratulations to the, those who, who uh, helped in recovering Dr. Knorr. And with that, I'm afraid we're in overtime Dr. Cheel, thank you for an outstanding grand rounds, and we're going to move along to our quality improvement conference. Okay, thanks.